Αγαπητές φίλες, αγαπητοί φίλοι, καλησπέρα σας. Σας καλωσορίζω στην αποψινή δημόσια τηλεδιάλεξη του Ανοιχτού Πανεπιστημίου Κύπρου και του Μεταπτυχιακού Προγράμματος ΠΝΙΚΑ Πολιτική Ιστορία, Θεωρία και Πράξη με καλεσμένη μας μία συνάδελφο πανεπιστημιακό από το εξωτερικό, συγκεκριμένα από την Ουκρανία, την δόκτωρα Ειρήνα Λοσίεβα. Η κυρία Λοσίεβα βρίσκεται αυτές τις μέρες στο Ανοιχτό Πανεπιστήμιο Κύπρου, στο πλαίσιο του προγράμματος Ακαδημαϊκής Κινητικότητας Εράσμους Plus και δίνει αυτή την εβδομάδα μία σειρά υβριδικών τηλεδιαλέξεων πάνω σε ζητήματα της ειδικότητά τη. Απόψε, για λογαριασμό του μεταπτυχιακού μας προγράμματος, για λογαριασμό της ΠΜΙΚΑΣ, θα παρουσιάσει ένα πολύ ενδιαφέρον θέμα, μία διάλεξη με θέμα Ukraine Threats, Challenges and Perspectives, δηλαδή η Ουκρανία, απειλές, προκλήσεις και προοπτικές. Και σε αυτό το σημείο θα μου επιτρέψετε να αλλάξω τη γλώσσα, να αρχίσω από εδώ και πέρα να χρησιμοποιώ την Αγγλική, προκειμένου να καλωσορίσω την αποψινή μας ομιλήτρια και προσκεκλημένη και να, τον, να την παρουσιάσω, δηλαδή να κάνω μία σύντομη παρουσίαση του βιογραφικού της στα αγγλικά, προτού της δώσουμε τον λόγο για την ομιλία της. So, at this moment I would like to welcome Dr. Losieva to the Open University of Cyprus and to our master's program, NICS, Political History, Theory and Practice. And I would like to introduce Mrs. Losieva, uh, her short uh, CV. So, Dr. Irina Losieva graduated from the Ivan Franco National University of Lviv with a PhD degree from the Middle East Technical University. She is an associate professor at the Faculty of International Relations of the Ivan Franco National University, and she works at the Department of Foreign Languages. Dr. Lucieva has been actively engaged in the implementation of international projects, Tempus and Erasmus Plus. In the framework of project activities and international mobility programs, she has participated in numerous conferences and scientific seminars in, U in Ukraine and abroad. She is the author of numerous scientific articles and her research interests relate to modern methods of teaching foreign languages, political discourse, political debates and propaganda, linguistic manipulation and lingual pragmatics and intercultural communication. Dr. Ina Losieva will speak us today about Ukraine threats, challenges and perspectives and we are grateful to have her with us and we are looking forward to her talk. Dr. Losieva, the floor is yours for your lecture. Good evening to all of you. Thank you for introduction, for introducing me. Thank you for hosting me at the Open University of Cyprus. That's a great experience for me as well. To be here and to have my second lecture. So today we are going to speak about Ukraine. So, but before we start dealing with the presentation itself and with the topic which is announced, I would like to give you like a short brief and a short introduction into the country where I'm from and into the city where I'm from and just some brief information about the university itself. Uh, so, first of all, I would like to say that we are located in Eastern Europe, so we, Ukraine is Eastern European country with a population of about 42.5 million, but at, the, at this point I would like to make a short comment and tell that nowadays the population is numbered approximately 28, 40, 34 million people because of a great number of people leaving the country because of the situation and uh, we are and we used to be the most populous country 
in the, 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 the 30 second most populous country in the world. So the capital of the country is Kiev, the capital city of Ukraine, with a population of 3.5 million people. And nowadays the number is becoming higher due to the number of internally displaced people who are coming from eastern and southern part of Ukraine to the central parts. So uh, the city where I am from is the city of Lviv, which is usually called the capital of Western Ukraine and the cultural and tourist center of Western Ukraine, because the city is located 70 kilometers to the Polish border. The city is really ancient as it was founded in 1256. Nowadays, the population is about 1 million people or even higher, again, due to the high number of people coming from eastern, southern regions and the high number of students. Um, just an inter nowadays, it's uh, the biggest humanitarian hub and uh, the interesting fact that the distance from Lviv to Nicosia is about 2,420 kilometers. So the city has numerous historical sites and monuments. All of them are inscribed into UNESCO World Heritage List. So the city has always been a popular tourist destination. And in current reality, it has also become the biggest center of humanitarian aid and voluntary epicenter. The city contains of, uh, if to speak, just a few words about education in, in V. So the city numbers total of 12 universities, eight academies, and a number of smaller schools of higher education. Eight institutes of National Academy of Science of Ukraine and more than 40 research institutes. Over 100,000 students annually study in more than 50 higher educational establishments. And if you speak about the university where I'm from, it's the Ivan Franco National University of Lviv, one of the oldest universities in Ukraine, which was founded in 1661, and one of the biggest in Eastern Europe. The university is strongly committed to promoting excellence in research and is ranked by Hirsch Index, the third place among Ukrainian universities and the second in Ukraine by the number of applications. So the status of national university was granted on October 11, 1999, and we have the highest level of accreditation. So it's a classical example of higher education institution with powerful academic schools, old traditions and modern innovative approaches. So the university consists of 19 faculties, 146 departments. The number of students is about 25,000 25, people. So just some numbers in order to understand like how we work and what is about the university. So the staff of the university is about 2,000 people. About 200 of them are professors, 998 associate professors, and 20, or nowadays the number is getting higher, 25,000 students, who are majoring in 111 fields. So nowadays, uh, the students have the options to choose from 23 foreign languages to study, and there, there are numerous student public organizations for socializing and active involvement in the student's life. So the faculty where I am from is the Faculty of International Relations, and uh, the students of the faculty, as well as uh, Staff members take part in international cooperation, international programs, projects, promote integration into the educational sector, regular staff, well-known professors, researchers from different countries all over the world, uh, 
visit the university, visit the faculty, have their internships and join projects. So the faculty, we have concluded the agreement with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs on training the specialists for diplomatic service of Ukraine. And that is like the main field where the students majored, so diplomatic service and international relations. So graduates of the faculty have successfully built their professional careers in various international organizations, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Ukraine, and even the Parliament of Ukraine. Currently, the university is having an intensive cooperation under the European programs, such as Erasmus+, Plus, Visegrad Fund, Baltic University Program, Horizon 2020, and many other projects funded by the European Union. So that was like a short introduction, brief introduction into the topic, and that was everything about the life of the city, the life of the university, and the life of every single Ukrainian before the 24th of February 2022. So after this tragic day in the calendar of every Ukrainian, the situation and the life of single person has dramatically changed. On the 24th of February in 2022, so Russia invaded and occupied parts of Ukraine in major escalation of the Russia-Ukrainian war, which actually began in 2014. So the actual year and the date when everything started is 2014, not just a year ago. The invasion has resulted in tens of thousands of deaths on both sides and instigated Europe, Europe's largest refugee crisis since World War II. So about 8 million Ukrainians were displaced within their country by June of the year 2022, and more than 8.1 million had fled the country by March 2023. The invasion began at the dawn of February the 24th, with infantry division and armed and air support in eastern Ukraine, dozens of missile attacks across both eastern Ukraine and western Ukraine. The first fighting took place in Lugansk Oblast, which is the eastern part of the country right close to the border with Russia. It happened early in the morning at 3.40 a.m. The main infantry and tank attacks were launched in four spearhead incursions, creating a northern front launched towards Kyiv, a southern front originating in Crimea, a southeastern front launched at the cities of Luhansk and Donetsk, and an eastern front. So, and uh, dozens of missile strikes across Ukraine and even reached the furthest point of the country as far west as Lviv, 70 kilometers to the Polish border. So, and here you can see the map of Russian invasion. So the situation which was on the 24th of February, 2022. So how everything began. Four months before, for, set, for, for many months before the invasion, Russian troops messed around Ukraine's borders while Russian officials repeatedly denied any plans to attack Ukraine. But at the same time, pouring experts and world leaders were sending lots of information regarding the possibility of the invasion and proving that the possibility was really high. And uh, on 24th of February 2022, Russian president announced so-called special military operation to support the Russian-controlled breakaway republics of Donetsk and Luhansk, whose military forces had been fighting Ukraine in the Donbass conflict since 2014. It was said that the goal was to demilitarize and denazify Ukraine and uh, the president of Russia exposed irredentist views, challenged Ukraine's right 
to independence, Ukraine's right to statehood, and falsely claimed that Ukraine has governed by neo-Nazis who persecuted the ethnic Russian minority. Minutes later, Russian airstrikes and the ground invasion were launched along a northern front from Belarus towards Kyiv, a northeastern front towards Kharkiv, a southern front from Crimea, and a southeastern front from Donbass. In response, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky enacted martial law and ordered a general mobilization. Russian troops had retreated from the northern front by April, and on the southern and southeastern fronts, Russia captured Kherson, which was in March, and then Mariupol in May. It happened after a destructive siege. On April 18, Russia launched a renewed battle of the bus. Russian forces continued to bomb both military and civilian targets far from the front line, including Ukraine's energy grade throughout the winter. So throughout November, December, and January, so Ukraine was in, in a complete darkness and we lived according to the timetable, the timetable indicating the, uh, the hours when people had electricity in their houses and the hours where, where electricity was uh, cut off. In late 2022, Ukraine launched counteroffensives in the south and in the east. Soon after, Russia announced the illegal annexation of four partly occupied regions. In November, Ukraine retook Kherson, and on February 2023, Russia mobilized nearly 200,000 soldiers were renewed offensive towards Bakhmut. Nowadays, Bakhmut is one of the hottest points, the city which is totally destroyed, completely swept out, but the fights are going on. The invasion has been met with widespread international condemnation. The United Nations General Assembly passed resolution condemning the invasion and demanding a full withdrawal of Russian forces. The International Court of Justice ordered Russia to suspend military operations, and the Council of Europe expelled Russia from the organization. Many countries imposed sanctions on Russia and on its ally Belarus, and provided humanitarian and military aid to Ukraine. Over 1,000 companies left Russia and Belarus in response to the invasion. The International Criminal Court in The Hague opened the investigation into the possible crimes against humanity, war, war crimes, abduction of children, and genocide during the invasion. Issuing an arrest warrant for Putin in March 2023. So speaking about the cities, of the, the real tragedy is, is associated with every destroyed city, but one of the first cities which were cruelly destroyed and devastated is the city of Mariupol. The city is in Donetsk region since May 2022. It has been occupied by Russian forces. It is situated on the very northern coast of the Sea of Azov. So prior to the Russian invasion of Ukraine, it was the 10th largest city in the country and the second largest city in Donetsk Oblast with an estimated population of about half a million people. It was the center of metallurgic industry and industrial center in the southern and eastern region itself. Um, in January 2022, Ukrainian authorities estimated that the current population of Mariupol is approximately 100,000 people. Beginning on, beginning on November 
the 24th, the three months long siege of Mariupol by Russian forces largely destroyed the city, for which it was given the title Hero City of Ukraine. So the title was given by the Ukrainian government and on the 16th of May 2022, all Ukrainian troops who remained in Mariupol surrounded at Azovstal iron and steel works as the Russian military secured complete control over the city by May 2022. So as, um, my, as I'm engaged in the field of education, so I would pay my attention to one of the young universities, very successful universities, Mariupol State University, so which proved to be really modern, really innovative, with lots of programs of international mobility, joint projects, but that everything was before the war started. So we have our university had lots of joint programs and uh, international projects conducted with the State University of Mariupol. So nowadays it is being relocated, relocated to Kyiv and in this darkest of times continues to carry out the light of learning. Between February and May 2022, all five academic buildings of the university were destroyed or substantially damaged through the artillery bombardment that accompanied the siege of Mariupol. The continuation of the higher education is in itself a a potential symbol of the resistance of the entire system of education in Ukraine. Despite, despite the daily toll of destruction and misery, it is essential that life and learning continues in Ukraine. Many of the students and academics will be the vanguard of rebuilding a destroyed city and a besieged country both physically and culturally. The continuation of the higher education is a remarkable symbol of the entire system of the resistance of every Ukrainian, of every single person in Ukraine nowadays. Uh, having a look at this at this picture, so these are the real pictures taken somewhere in June 2022. So these are the school leaders, the young people who were going to finish the school, to graduate from school, and to get ready for their future education somewhere in Ukraine or abroad, but they had no chance to organize their prom, to organize the graduation ceremony, and they decided to have a kind of like event, to have a kind of photo session on them, those places which used to be their schools before. So these are like the ruins of the schools where they studied, and they decided to wear their clothes, which they were getting, they were like getting ready for the graduation ceremony. So if we speak about education, education at war, if we speak about schools, as a result of uh, military aggression, about 1,259 schools have been damaged. And this constitutes 11% of schools in the country. 223 schools have been completely destroyed. Half of the destroyed and damaged schools are located in Donetsk, Kherson, and again, those regions which were the first to, to be shelled and destroyed. So half of 
the cities, schools, for example, in Kharkiv have been impacted. Schools located near the front line or the border are under constant increased threat of destruction due to continuous shelling. At the same time, schools in different areas located further away from the front line and the border also, also suffer from missile attack. During the year 2022, education process in all Ukrainian schools was paused for a while due to full-scale invasion, at least for two weeks. But in many schools, it was a longer period, and in some, the pause lasted up until the end of 2022 school year. The students who resumed their studies in 2022 mostly studied online until the end of the school year. For the children living in the occupied areas, access to proper education in Ukrainian schools has remained limited or unavailable due to problems with communication and threats by occupation administration. The experience of studying during the COVID-19 pandemic allowed schools to adopt to remote learning during martial law more quickly. So it was so-called pre-preparation stage. However, remote learning still bears the risk of worsening the quality of education and student progress, as well as deepening the existing education inequalities. In addition, students are school children are overloaded with homework and individual tasks to be completed and it can be negatively it can negatively affect the mental and emotional state of the participants of educational process. Then what negatively affected the mental and emotional states both of students and teachers according to the survey the majority of parents 61 percent of them believe that their children have symptoms of stress such as deteriorated sleep anxiety trouble concentrating problems in communication with the peers and teachers children have high levels uh, of anxiety as well, young children, and in addition, students feel lonely because they lack the opportunities to, social, to socialize with peers and teachers, and everyone experienced considerable stress and worsened mental state. In the medium term perspective, Ukraine's post war rebuilding, according to the government's plan, is meant to be done with broad involvement of funding from international partners and with an orientation towards Ukraine's EU integration. Meanwhile, international organizations and charities are already acting as important partners for Romada, so called communities in the restoration of schools and provision of access to education by undertaking some of the repairs, providing computers, power sources, and other resources needed by school. In addition, international organizations and charities create opportunities for studying in places where the infrastructure has been destroyed. In the different region, school restorations is at different stages. As of February 2000, 2359 of damaged schools have been restored in the Chernihiv region. 71% of schools which suffered damages had been restored in the Kiev region. Meanwhile, in the Kharkiv region, hardly any rebuilding has been done. Only 13 out of 296 damaged schools have been restored. This can be explained by the fact that Kharkiv region was liberated much later than the two other regions, but military actions and intense shelling still continue in a part of the region, and that the scale of destruction is much bigger here. 
One more challenge every school and every educational institution had to face was to, to provide bomb shelters in every building of the school or educational establishment. During the summer of 2022, lots of money was put into the reconstruction of the basement floor with providing all necessary things, uh, drinking water, heating, toilets, so everything was taken into consideration and uh, there were regulations and norms according to which every educational institution had to be equipped with a bomb shelter. Because in case of an air raid alert, the educational process is stopped and all the students or school children together with their teacher had to go down to the bomb shelter and wait there until there will be the information that they are allowed to leave it. So over one, over 8.1 million refugees in Ukraine have been recorded across Europe, while an estimated 8 million others had been displayed within the country by late 2022, and they got the status of internally displaced person. Approximately one quarter of the country's total population had left their homes in Ukraine by March the 20th. So in total, the numbers are given here. So Poland is the country which hosted the highest number of refugees, as well as Germany, Italy, Spain, United Kingdom, as well as Greece and Cyprus. And uh, we are sending our gratitude to every single person, to every single country, who stand with us and who every day do their utmost to support the country financially, to provide some humanitarian aid and stand with us till the end. Despite the daily toll of destruction and misery, it is essential that life and learning continues in Ukraine. Many of the students and the academics that teach the students will be the people who will lead the process of rebuilding the country and that will be our future task to stand together and participate in the process of rebuilding. The continuation of higher education is a symbol of the resistance of every single Ukrainian. In the face of unprecedented Russian military aggression, Ukrainians are more united than ever in their desire for democracy with a historic high 95% supporting Ukraine becoming a fully functioning democracy and an opinion shared equally across all the regions. Ukrainians identified freedom of speech, equal justice for all, and free and fair elections as the three most important characteristics of a fully functioning democracy. The level of optimism remains strong, according to the numbers given by the survey, 68% are optimistic about the future, and the reason for their optimism are inspiring, including Ukraine's victory, its people and their strength, and of course, the huge support coming from the world community. The full-scale war has an impact on every Ukrainian, every single person in the country with many people reporting income reduction, deterioration of mental and physical health, separation and loss of friends and family, 
loss of jobs and homes. Although the war has taken a significant toll on people's lives and financial condition, nearly all Ukrainians are contributing to the humanitarian and war effort. 81% of people have donated money to the armed forces, even though 95% have reported that they don't have enough income to live comfortably these days. Additionally, 63% have donated supplies to internally displaced persons, 60% have donated money for humanitarian relief, and the majority have hosted and assisted internally displaced persons. It is clear to see the level of commitment that everyday Ukrainians have for their compatriots, their communities and their country. The biggest problem for Ukraine will be the number, the huge number of young children aged 5, 10 and as well as young people in their teens who left the country with their mothers. Why mothers? Because men are not allowed to leave the country. A lot of experts predict that Ukraine will lose half a, a huge number of its young generation, which can be a real problem for the democratic situation in the country. Ukrainian trust the armed forces almost unanimously at the level of 95% and 81% of Ukrainians trust the president of Ukraine, Volodymyr Zelensky. Ukrainians show strong and united support for integration into the European Union and NATO. 92% want Ukraine to join the European Union and 79% want Ukraine to join NATO. These views extend across all of Ukraine, South and East included, regional variations in support for Ukraine joining the EU or NATO, which were seen in the previous polls, have virtually disappeared. Ukrainians do not see their territory as a collection of bargaining chips. Rather, they overwhelmingly indicate that they are fighting and sacrificing to restore Ukraine's territorial integrity and sovereignty. This is the only outcome of the war that is deemed acceptable. So this is the only way out of this tragedy that is considered to be acceptable by every Ukrainian, by the government, and by all of those people who lost their nearest and dearest in this unjust and, and horrible war. So thank everything, we thank you, thank every single person and every country for standing with us. Thank you for standing with Ukraine. So that was like a short and brief overview of the current situation of the Ukraine as the European countries, which had, which before the war had huge prospects developing in economics and the country was building some plans and orient, was orienting into European integration, but everything changed and the reality changed as well. So thank you for your attention and I would be really happy if you give your comments and if you share some of your visions and ideas related to the topic. Thank you very much, Dr. Lucieva, for this very insightful and very informative account of all the suffering and destruction 
caused by the Russian invasion and the war, destruction and suffering that affected not only the Ukrainian cities and infrastructures, but also the Ukrainian education. And it is really important that all people engaged in education in Ukraine continue to give their best to transmit knowledge and to continue all educational activities. This is one of the most important forms of resistance, in my view, against aggression and against war. We have, we have already some uh, messages in the chat panel. For example, our friend Nikos S says, thanks a lot for your presentation and for the insights you have provided. Mrs. Elizabeth Yanakopoulou writes, thank you, you have our full support. And it is the right moment to say that we can start the discussion. And I see now the comment by Evgenia Karatari. Allow me to thank you for this excellent presentation and express my deepest sympathy and compassion for your country in these difficult times. I would like to ask you uh, how you see the, the end state of Russia's invasion. Thank you. Thank you for your comments and thank you, Evgenia, for the questions. And there are lots of discussions, lots of experts and opinions and possible like options how to end the state of invasion. But our country, the president, the government, together with all people, so we strictly stand on the idea that Ukrainians borderlines have to be returned to their previous state that was till the year 1991. So the occupied territories should be deoccupied and the borders should be retained to their previous like lines. But the price of the price of the war and uh, the price of uh, like the final result is extremely high. It's extremely high for Ukraine as every day numbers and numbers of uh, men, our soldiers die and uh, the numbers are really huge. So the main and strong point is uh, territorial integrity and uh, the borders, the sovereignty looks like that. But there are lots of other like opinions by the experts given. So it looks like that. Maybe you have some of uh, some of uh, like visions how the situation can be solved. It would be interesting for me to hear and to listen to you, just to read the comments. Because I am from my own perspective and you are on the other, like in other position of it and you can give some your own vision. Thank you very much, Dr. Lucieva. I would like to inform our students that I have, uh, in the meanwhile, I have activated also the microphone and camera in case you want to take the microphone and speak. And of course, let me say something in Greek. Εάν θέλετε να υποβάλετε ερωτήματα και στα ελληνικά, μπορείτε να το κάνετε και εμείς θα τα μεταφράσουμε. 